Good morning, everybody. Um, I think there's still some people joining us, but we will get started and um, just quickly do a run through our usual housekeeping. Um, so please, can you remember to mute your lines um, and turn your videos off whilst the speakers are presenting? But please feel free, obviously, to put your videos back on for any questions and discussion. Um, Please raise your hands, let us know um, if you've got comments, questions, want to give feedback and also obviously please share your comments, reflections in the chat function. We are obviously recording the webinar as usual so that those that aren't able to attend today can watch it at a later stage. Um, and just a reminder, so we obviously don't have time to introduce everybody that's on the call, but if you have a look at the participant list, you'll be able to see the spread of different representatives from um, different professions, organisations that, that are on the call today. Um, so please familiarise yourselves with that. OK, next slide, please. So. Um, today's agenda item, um, we are discussing dads and partners in line with the long term plan at Flexible Ambition. Um, and we'll have a bit of an introduction, national and regional update from myself and Jenny. Um, and then we've got some great speakers as usual lined up. Um, so Lucy will be talking about LGBTQ parents and perinatal mental health. Then Mark Williams has given us kind permission to show a film about the importance of new fathers at mental health, um, which we will show in the middle. And then um, the last speakers today will be Ali and Chris, who are going to talk about their role as carers, peer support workers from Southern Health. And that's part of our um, standing agenda item in terms of the hashtag my name is looking at different roles that are developing within the specialist perinatal mental health services so as usual a packed agenda we will keep to time um, but hopefully some really interesting um, information that will be shared today thank you next slide please so just a bit of a national and regional update from myself and jenny next slide please and first of all, I just wanted um, to reflect a little bit, really. So Jenny and I were talking and realised this week that it's a year since we've been doing these webinars. Um, and I think certainly the two of us, and I'm sure many of you here today, um, didn't think we'd still be in this position one year on. I don't think we had any comprehension of what the year ahead was going to be like. Um, and... COVID will have touched us all in very different ways, both professionally and personally. And we absolutely acknowledge that um, many of us are exhausted with the year that has played out. But we wanted to thank you for your commitment and all the hard work that you have done to still improve perinatal mental health services through this last year. Um, and we hope that as the lockdown starts to ease and restrictions start to ease that there will be the opportunity for people to spend some time with loved ones with family and friends and also to have some time for annual leave um, and rest really um, so thank you um, it has been a really tough year but there has still been fantastic things achieved and there will still be fantastic work that continues so thank you and it's every opportunity that I get to share a Charlie Macassay picture I do so I hope you appreciate that. Sean can we move on to the next slide please? Um, we also wanted to put in a little bit of a feature going forward in the webinar to so do a bit of a congratulation um, thinking about the fantastic work that's been done by all of you um, and so we've got two shout outs today but what I would ask is um, where people have had good news and that, please, please share it with us so that we can we can share it and talk about it on these webinars. We'd really like to do that. So the two shout outs I have today is um, firstly to Joe Spores at Southern Health. So um, Joe's article and the link to the article is there. Um, so they did an article looking at search engines and what perinatal um, terms were searched during the pandemic 
And what was really interesting is actually there was less searches for the severe end of perinatal mental health in terms of purple psychosis, etc. But um, lots and lots of searches in terms of loneliness, isolation, concerns with um, bonding with babies and infants. It's a really fantastic article, so we would really encourage you to click on the link and have a look at it. So well done, Joe. And our second shout out today is for Dawn. Um, and Dawn was awarded the prestigious Edith Cavill, Cavill Award this year. Um, so as it says, these awards are for people who shine bright and show exceptional care to one of these three groups of people. So colleagues, patients or patients, families. And Dawn got the award for converting um, the knowing me, knowing you groups um, to be um, facilitated virtually during the pandemic. So congratulations to Dawn for that award. Um, well deserved. So. Um, please do send us your good news stories and we will include them going forward. So on to the national kind of updates. There is a lot of information on this slide. I don't expect you to be able to read it all now, but I wanted to include it so that when you get the slide set, you can come back and refer to it. This is with regards to the perinatal mental health access metric. Um, and we know that this has been a challenge in terms of achieving the access target. But we wanted to confirm this has been taken from the latest question and answer um, guidance that the national team have published. So up until now, most people have, have um, counted their first face to face contact of that being video or you know, video virtual, but not telephone. What the national team are saying within this guidance is that although the first contact might be telephone, if there is a subsequent video contact, virtual contact, face to face contact, then that obviously counts towards um, the target. It's not just the first appointment. So the consequences of that is you need to make sure that the data is flowing. Um, so speak to the data analysts that you have supporting your services to make sure that any subsequent appointment that is face to face or video is being counted towards the metric and not just the first appointment. OK, so that's the key message. If anybody's got any queries about that, please come back to Jenny and I. Um, we will be doing some further support with this um, with the specialist teams. Um, but do come back to us or put any um, questions in the chat box. OK. Next slide, please. So we've shared um, the information on this slide about the national workshops previously in some of the earlier wo um, webinars. Um, these are in relation to the implementation of the best practice guides. Um, and also in support of the long term plan commitments. But previously we didn't have all the dates. There were only some of the dates. So we just wanted to highlight this now that all the dates are there and remind you that these workshops are being held nationally by the national team. But the email address um, in, or, in order to register for those workshops is included on that slide. So please do contact the national team directly to book yourselves a place. Thank you. Next slide. OK, I'm going to hand over to Jenny now. He's going to talk about um, DAS and Partners and some of the key resources. Good morning, everybody. Um, there's quite a lot of resources today, so that's that's really nice to be able to share with you. And some of them are themed to our topic of DAS and Partners and some of them are more generalist. Um, so just to take the first one, that's a link to a recent presentation by Dr Andy Mayers. Um, and I would thoroughly recommend watching that for anybody that's involved in developing the work around dads and partners. There's a lot of really interesting and helpful background information and also um, going on to, to how, what helps, what makes a difference, what dads want. 
Um, the second one there, Baby Buddy. Um, so Baby Buddy 2 is in development at the moment. I'm sure everyone on the call will be familiar with Baby Buddy. Um, and there's going to be much more content in Baby Buddy 2 for dads and partners. So um, I actually found this in Andy's presentation, but I thought it was worth mentioning separately that they need beta testers for um, for some of this new content. So if you've got any um, dads and partners that you think might be willing to help um, test, do get in touch and let's help develop um, that content into something really fab and meaningful oh, for, yeah. um, for our um, dads and partners. OK, next slide, please. Um, Best Beginnings have some good online support for dads and partners, and I'm sure a lot of you would have found that for yourselves. Um, but again, worth highlighting, I think there's been some updating and some additions there. Um, just one for the diary, International Father's Mental Health Day. We'll hear a bit about that from Mark Williams film later. But um, on Monday the 21st of June. So it actually does give us enough time if people wanted to do anything um, special to mark that day. Um, there's the date for your diary. And also um, to remind us all again about DadPad, which people are finding um, really useful. And I think there's some development work with DadPad around um, making that a bit more inclusive and not just about dads. So um, we'll we'll keep you up to date with any developments there. Next slide, please. Um, so this slide has got a couple of um, really important publications for us. The first one is the Best Start for Life report. So I know a lot of you on the call would have contributed to this, actually. there's I know there's a number of names I recognise from the all-party parliamentary group. And this piece of work has been a long time coming. It's It's been put together over a couple of years and has now been published in the last week or so. Um, we will be looking at this in a bit more depth on a future webinar. I just wanted to highlight the report today and to say I think anybody involved in this field needs to read it and, and get to know it because this is going to be quite a critical document for us going forward. Um, we are going to leave it probably until the June webinar to have a bit of a more in-depth discussion about this when we can see a if see the um in how it's interpreted by various um people but also to see if the money's going to flow because at the moment that's one of the biggest issues we've got some lovely vision in there for what services could look like but is the money going to follow and hopefully by june we'll have more of an idea of that and it kind of feeds back to, for those of you that were on previous webinars, it feeds back to the baby blind spot that um, Sally Lang, um, Becky Lang was talking about. Um, so we would we'll just see if, if that does get joined up thinking with the Treasury. And then the second one is um, from our friends from the Maternal Mental Health Alliance, which is um, maternal mental health during a pandemic. And there are so many lessons still to learn from this. They looked at, um, I think, 60 different studies that were done around maternal mental health and outcomes for babies during the pandemic. And if you don't want to read um, the whole thing, the second link is to a lovely short film. Um, it's literally, I think it was like two minutes, which captures all the key findings. So. And I would encourage all services to have a look at that and for your new starters, student induction, that sort of thing, just to help people get some context about why this works so important. And another really important message in there about staff wellbeing as well. Um, OK, next slide, please. Um, so this slide has been produced by the NHS 
to start to help with our thinking about making our services more inclusive. And um, I think that there's some some really good stuff on, on this slide for us all to be thinking about. Um, so that, again, might be something that um, you want to pick up and have a think about in your work going forward. And it's downloadable from the link um, underneath when the slide pack comes out. OK, next slide, please. So I am absolutely delighted to be able to hand over to Lucy. Um, Lucy is going to talk to us about LGBTQ parents and perinatal mental health. Um, we're also regionally, we have commissioned Lucy to do some further training for us. Um, and that training will be targeted at certain um, of the stakeholders within the perinatal pathway. So um, watch your inboxes for invitations to put names forward over the next week or so. Um, so Lucy, I hope you've been using the introduction time to set yourself up because I know that you wanted to, to show your own slides. So can you let me know if you're ready to hand over? Um, yeah, hi, thank you. Hi, <laughs> can, you can you hear me okay? Yeah, that's lovely. Okay, yeah, brilliant. I shall hand yeah. over to you then. I'm Lucy. Not, yeah, I don't use Teams that often, so you might just have to bear with me while I find I'm normally on Zoom. So I, okay. I'll, uh, I'll press share content and we'll see if that works. <laughs> okay, go for it. Uh, I'll go for it. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Okay. There we go. Can you see that? Perfect. Thanks, Lucy. Brilliant. Excellent. OK, I can't see myself anymore. Oh, oh, heck. Right, we'll see. <laughs> see how I get on with teams. I can't see anybody anymore. Um, is that normal? It is, unfortunately. OK, that's all right. I'll, uh, yeah, brilliant. Um, OK, well, thank you for that introduction. So. Um, I'm going to talk for the next kind of 25 minutes um, about looking at LGBTQ parents and perinatal, uh, perinatal mental health. Um, so to start with, I'm going to kind of talk through um, my experience really of perinatal mental health and being a um, one of two mums to, to our daughter. Um, and then I'm going to give an overview and a bit of an introduction really to um, not too much because obviously we've got the training coming up in May as well. Um, but a bit, a bit of a timeline looking at LGBTQ parents as well. Um, and then looking a bit about mental health and what the barriers might be for LGBTQ um, people in accessing support. Um, and also just looking at that NHS slide, there was, there was one point made about kind of looking at language. So I'm going to talk a bit about inclusive language and how we can be more inclusive uh, and then go through a bit about the training that I'm going to be delivering as well. OK, so I'm just going to spend a bit of time talking about our story and how I'm here today, really talking to you about LGBTQ um, parents. So with with the LGBTQ people, um, becoming pregnant is something that you have to or starting a family is something that you have to take quite a long time over planning. Um, it's not just going to necessarily happen overnight. Um, so what we did is we we sat and obviously chatted about which you know which route we were going to take um and we decided well first of all we went to our gp and we were asking him um what our options were in the in the borough that we were living in london at the time um and unfortunately the gp's response was that he didn't know this was eight years ago that he didn't know um but he thought a friend he had a friend in canada who might be able to help so that was the, the sum total of the assistance that, that we got from our GP. I mean, luckily what we had done um, is we'd done a lot of research about what was available. We just wanted him to say, yes, I'll refer you on. So we knew what was available. And this is pretty much what's available across the, across England, really. What the offer is for, for lesbian parents is, or parents to be, is that you have to have had six failed attempts of IUI 
um, before you will be before it be kind of looked at to see what the issues might be, and then you might be referred to have IVF. So in order to have six rounds of IUI, bearing in mind we had two, which cost six thousand um, pounds, it's quite quite a lot of money to start with. So what we decided to do, we looked at different clinics um, in London. We went on. Um, kind of different open evenings. This was eight years ago, so I imagine things have changed now. But we didn't feel that we were necessarily included in the speeches that were taking place. You know, we were paying for this clinic. So what we decided to do, we went to, on a friend's recommendation, and went to Copenhagen, where there was a, a clinic there that was much more inclusive. It was run by two lesbians, a midwife and, and a doctor. Um, and so on day of ovulation or within 24 hours of testing doing the ovulation um, we got on a plane and went to Copenhagen for the day um, which luckily it was only the day because Copenhagen has to be probably one of the most expensive cities beautiful um, what we saw of it and this is just the, the front of the clinic that we used as well so as I've said we, we had two attempts and the second one was successful which was fantastic then I was pregnant um, and I remember we, we were going on a trip from we lived in South East London and we were going on a trip to, to Whitstable for the day um, and got on the train. Didn't know I was pregnant at this point And I could just I said to my partner, I said, I can smell aftershave. And there was nobody else in the carriage as we'd got on. And so at that point, I was thinking, oh, maybe it's worked and I am pregnant. So this was a very, very exciting time for us. Um, but unfortunately, throughout my pregnancy as well, I experienced um morning sickness which isn't obviously everybody has morning sickness but I couldn't really eat um I lasted most of the pregnancy it, I couldn't sleep um and I was working quite a particularly stressful job um with long hours um so that that was going on as well um every midwife appointment we went to our experience was you know it was a different midwife so we had to come out every time I had to kind of tell my story this is how we've become pregnant um and also the thoughts of will we actually be discriminated against um, when we're having these appointments as well. So all these things are kind of going through through my mind. Oh, this photo here is um, the first time I actually ate something in France when I was about three months pregnant and I managed to eat some cold soup. So that was all rather exciting. Of that. And then this is me 36 weeks pregnant as well. So throughout my pregnancy, I was also experiencing um, some kind of personal issues as well. Um, and this really marred the pregnancy. I was crying a lot. I, I'm, I think now I was I was quite depressed throughout my pregnancy, but didn't really talk or people didn't really ask um, at appointments either what was going on for me. Um, so that was the, the pregnancy experience. And we attended NCT classes and um, the hospital antenatal classes. And our birth plan was that we were going to go to the, the birth centre at Lewisham Hospital, the natural birth centre. We were going to have the, our baby in the bath and it was all going to be marvellous. So fast forward to February the 23rd, 2014, um, about five o'clock in the evening, I went into labour and this continued. Um, the labour lasted about 36 hours. So started off in the birth centre. After nine hours there, it was decided that I need to be transferred to the maternity ward. The baby was back to back. It was extremely painful. I had various epidurals um, and eventually she was pulled out of me um, with forceps about 36 hours later, surrounded by about 10 different people being prepared for a cesarean, which which I didn't need to have. I also the placenta was stuck, so that was forcibly removed um, and that was ripped out of me as well. So it wasn't the ideal birth. Um, that's us wired up to the machines. Um, but as you can see there, she um, she was very keen to breastfeed straight away. So that, that was a, a blessing that that went well. Um, but after I was left in extreme shock, um, I was we went home a couple of days after that. Every time I lay down, I was rocking. I was I was quite traumatized by the whole thing. And as a result of the traumatic birth, I um, experienced postnatal depression. We spent about seven months trying to get help. I spoke to probably about eight different GPs um, and eventually um, it, we had the one and only 
community perinatal nurse at the time where we were living suddenly arrived in our living room um, and within minutes of, of talking to me after seven months of, of struggling trying to get help went had a private counsellor she knew immediately what was going on um, and she said that there's a bed at the um, Bethlehem mother and baby unit in, in South London which luckily was only 20 minutes away from us um, so that was me outside <laughs> walking along the streets near the mother and baby unit um, and that was a um, a charity shop book that we managed to get to Oxfam one day near the mother and baby unit and I, I bought Edie that charity book so all these were little you know little successes of the day and after being discharged I am actually by trade a secondary school teacher so I went back to teaching in East London and then got a promotion so everything everything was okay but just thinking about that time as well one of the 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 biggest concerns for us is because we couldn't didn't see ourselves anywhere in any literature or in any policies there was no photos of lgbtq families we were thinking is this service for us is this somewhere where we're going to feel comfortable are we going to be discriminated against are we going to be discriminated against by the other families that are there there was no visible sign that this was a place that wasn't going to discriminate against against us i mean our experience there was fantastic the help was um, brilliant but you've always got this kind of niggling feeling at the back of your your mind as well and also what support was there for my partner as as the other mother as well um she's clearly not a dad so there was a father's group um but that didn't that wasn't going to meet her needs she was offered counseling by them we saw counseling a counselor there as well which was fantastic um but those are the questions is this service for us are we going to be discriminated against and there's no images of, of families like us there Okay, so that that's a, a, a brief kind of story of, of my of our experience. And it was a couple of about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago now, this past year seems to have gone through in a bit of a blur, hasn't it? But so a couple of years ago, we, we've since after leaving, we left London about four years ago and moved down to Cornwall. So that's where where we are now. Um, and it was a couple of years ago, I went up to a charity in um, Bristol, Bluebell, um, who works with families with perinatal mental health issues, to, to, just to talk to them about what they were doing. I wanted to start something in, in Cornwall, a kind of a support group. So I was just chatting. And on the way out, the chief exec, I'd mentioned that I'd worked for Stonewall in the past. And, and she said, oh, that's really interesting because we'd like some training on, you know, what we can do for LGBTQ families. So I developed uh, the training. Um, and that's what I've been delivering to NHS perinatal teams kind of over the past um, over the past year on Zoom as well. So I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. So that that's our experience. So what, what I'd like to do now is just to, you know, obviously we used IUI, there's different laws in place. I just want to talk through the legislation that are linked to LGBTQ parents just to give you a bit of context. And these only go back as far as, you know, coming up to 20 years ago now, but equal rights being applied to same sex adoption and fostering. Um, and there are, I think it's 16 percent of fostering and adoption placements now in England are with LGBTQ families. Um, in 2004, we've got Civil Partnerships Act. And kind of linked to this in 2008 we've got the human fertilization and embryology act which recognizes same-sex couples as legal parents of children conceived through the use of donated sperm eggs or embryos in 2009 allowed legislation allowed for lesbians to both be named on the birth certificate as parents so because april and i were uh, civilly partnered at the time of conception both of us are named on the birth certificate i was under the impression that it said parent one parent to or just parent parent because I, I was so unwell after having Edie that I didn't actually go and get her registered April did and then I never saw the birth certificate it was all a bit of a blur and it's only recently that I've been looking and it actually says mother and parent to and um, so it's still not quite as equal as we'd want it to be but it's definitely a step in the right direction and similarly we've got parental orders for gay men um, have been available for surrogacy arrangements but in these cases in the UK, um, you have to wait till the, the birthing of the, the surrogate has agreed that they will um, hand the baby over as well. So they have to kind of wait for quite a few months really for that to be signed. 
And in 2014, we had same-sex marriage. And these are the statistics. So I said, mentioned that uh, last year, 16% of adoptions in England involved same-sex parents. And in 2019, there were 212,000 same-sex families in the UK with an increase of 40% since 2015. I've got a, a couple of quotes here from some research, a journal um, written by Zoe Darwin and Mary Greenfield called Mothers and Others, the Is Invisibility of LGBTQ People in Reproductive and Infant Psychology. Um, and they quoted in the UK, data from fertility cl clinics and birth registrations identify that lesbian couples are one of the fastest growing groups within maternity services with fertility treatment and live births increasing by 15 to 20% in this group year on year for the past decade. And then if we think about transgender men as birthing um, parents as well, we've no figures are available for transgender people becoming pregnant or impregnating their partners. But we can see that referrals to UK gender clinics have however risen every year, have risen proportionately more for trans men than trans women, and given that literature shows many trans men wish to be parents, pregnant trans men may also be a growing population within maternity services as well. OK. So what I'd also like to talk a bit about, there's two reports that I go into more detail within the training. And uh, this is the um, the second report that I talk about, and it's LGBT in Britain. This report interviewed over 5,000 LGBT people across England, Scotland and Wales about their life in Britain today. And there's a, a select a, um, several reports as part of this large report, and one of them is is health health report. And this looks at the rates of depression, anxiety, and other mental health conditions amongst LGBT people. And it also looks at the accessibility of healthcare services and discrimination that LGBT people face when seeking medical support. So not only do we need to think about the increased rates of mental health for LGBT people, but also when accessing support, the people may experience discrimination. And this may be a barrier to actually accessing further, um, further um, help as well and support. So this is very um, prevalent, you know, could be um, uh, could be an issue with perinatal mental health services as well. If there's if there's a barrier to accessing support, if people don't see themselves within the service or they're not taken seriously, um, then this could be, you know, a barrier to accessing report um, services. So this is from 2018. And obviously, over the past year, the rates of mental health uh, have increased during the pandemic. And this will still be the same for LGBT people. But the statistics that we've got from 2018 showed that half of LGBT people said that they'd experienced depression within the last year. Three in 10 LGBT people and almost half of trans people said that they had thought about taking their own life. And 13% of LGBT people said that they had attempted to take their own life. So if we then start thinking about how we can apply this to becoming parents and, you know, obviously LGBT people are not more inherently more likely to have a mental health issue or experience. It's to do with discrimination. It's to do with bullying in schools. It's to do with feeling excluded from society, increased anxiety about coming out every time you go to an appointment or you're going to be outed at school. All those things can add to mental health experiences. And LGBT people have experienced anxiety in the last year from 2018, bisexual women 72% and then decreasing down to 53% of, of gay men. And for context, according to MIND, around one in six, 15% of adults in general um, in England report experiencing a common mental health problem in any given week. So this was statistics from 2018, so it's substantially higher for LG, the um, LGBTQ community. Um, and also looking at re um, research done around um, same-sex parents. And this piece of research was looking specifically, so when we're thinking about dads and partners, in, in this piece of research done from an NCT, a woman called Catherine Walker, her, her piece of research was, what issues do lesbian co-mothers face in their transition to parenthood? 
So she's named the um, the non-birthing parent as the co-mother because I have sometimes I have a bit of a, an issue as well around using the word partner, fathers and, and partners, because the, the partner, if we think about who the partner is, the partner is the partner of the, the birthing parent, not the partner of, of the child. So the child will have two mothers. Um, so in this case, they're, they're called lesbian co-mothers. And thinking about their emotional health and different factors. So a lack of support um, could be a factor for um, triggering postnatal depression, which a lot of LGBTQ people may experience. Um, family relationships that have become strained. So LGBTQ people may be um, ostracised from their family, don't live near their family. There is a small amount of re a small piece of research says that postnatal depression and um, there's higher rates within lesbian women. Also, there's more mental health and also thinking about signposting and identifying that postnatal depression can affect the partners and the, the lesbian co-mother as well as birth mothers. And then within this piece of research, there's a um, practitioner's toolkit. Um, so I've just put this on this um, presentation as well. And just to acknowledge that the lesbian co-mother or the, the other mother are, are not fathers. Um, so if there is a father's group that then becomes a partner's group, is that one or, you know, are that one or two um, lesbian mothers want, will they want to go along to that group? And also things like um, resources, you could use kind of unisex names so it doesn't specify a gender. Use a range of um, images of diverse range of couples. Um, maybe introduce antenatal bonding ideas um, for the lesbian co-mother as well, skin to skin, um, and also kind of look at the options of, of breastfeeding for both for both mothers. Also, how the lesbian co-mother would like to be referred to, so don't just assume that you know that they're going to be, you know, that they're going to be called mother as well, or mother, <laughs> they're going to be called mum as well. Um, also think about different time alone activities with the baby so that they can bond with their baby as well. And also it's an opportunity for couples to explore, explore their new rules and priorities. So have a discussion around that. OK, and any signposting or work, try and find out what's happening for the, um, the, the other mother as well, the lesbian co-mother kind of emotionally. So the other report that I, I talk more about within the training is called Unhealthy Attitudes, which interviewed over 3000 health and social care staff about their experiences of uh, issues relating to lesbian, gay, bisexual and trans healthcare and employment. And there was a whole plethora of, of respondents that took part in this, this research from 2015. So I talk more about this in the training, but I, what I've done is I've just pulled out a bit um, around feeling unequipped to challenge prejudice. So if if staff have seen prejudice happening um, within their team or to um, service users or patients, they're unsure necessarily what to do about it. Um, and the report shows that a quarter of staff have never received any equality and diversity training. And if they have, it didn't necessarily inc include LGBT patients and service users. And also any training that they've received, three quarters say that it didn't include anything on the health needs of LGBT people, the rights of same sex partners and parents, or the use of language and practices that are inclusive of LGBT communities. And the report also looked at um, people experiencing some form of unequal treatment from healthcare staff because they're LGBT. So when they do enter a service, 13% of LGBT people within this report, um, within the health report, sorry, said that they have experienced some kind of unequal treatment. And this rises to 19% of Black, Asian, minority, um, ethnic LGBT people. So we've got one in eight, and then one in five black, Asian and minority ethnic LGBT people. And this increases even more to 24% of Asian LGBT people that have experienced some form of unequal treatment. So if you're taking that as a, um, you know, kind of a benchmark of your experience when trying to access a, um, a service, 
if you then go on to be parents and if you then you know you're trying to access a service because you're you're not doing so well emotionally then you might have already experienced a lot of barriers so you may think hey it's not worth it is this service for me are they going to discriminate even more and particularly thinking about the non-birthing parents are they going to see me as as the a mother as well am i going to be sidelined you know i have quite a number of examples of um lesbian parents who've gone to appointments and people refer to the the other mother as, as their friend or the sister or their mother that they can't quite get their head around that somebody would that two women would have a have a baby so also thinking about the language that you use and is it inclusive we live in a society where we have that's particularly heteronormative um, and cis normative as well Things like, so thinking about um, um, perinatal and, and antenatal, think we've got things like father's groups, things are very kind of binary and mums and dads, mother and baby groups, uh, are all these things, even shops, I remember going to look for um, buggies and, you know, baby stuff when I was, when we were pregnant and um, mamas and papas was the shop that we went into. So this is a quote from the... Um, the NCT research um, and it says by one of the, um, the lesbian co-mothers, our teacher went out of her way of her way to refer consistently to partners instead of dads, which I really appreciated. However, the course materials were exclusively heteronormative, such as photographs of skin to skin featuring dads or babies responding to their dad's familiar voice immediately after birth. And I felt that my experience as lesbian co-mother wasn't reflected anywhere, at least not visually. I've also included a link here to um, Stonewall, which has got a glossary of terms, which may give you more of an overview of, of different words and different language, you know, <coughs> different words that you can use to be inclusive of, of LGBTQ people. Um, um, I look at case studies within the training as well, and this is just a, a little bit of, of one of a case study that I may use with, with the training in, in May. Excuse me, I'm just got a bit of water. Um, and this is um, a woman's experience, Nisha. So Nisha and her wife have two children, a four and a half year old who was carried by her wife, Nisha's wife, and a one year old who was carried by Nisha. They used IVF for both children by using her wife's eggs for both children and donor sperm. So Nisha experienced postnatal depression after their first child was born. So she was a non-birthing parent and there was no help offered as the non-birthing parent. And Nisha supports, um, sought support from a private counselling. When she was 20 weeks pregnant, she began to experience prenatal depression and she was referred to the perinatal mental health team where she received excellent support. During her appointment with the perinatal team, she asked them if she if she had been referred to their team four and a half years ago as a non-birthing mother, would she have been seen by them? And the answer was that they were unsure. So that's just something to think about. Um, is the support offered purely surrounding the, the, the birthing parent um, or is there support for, for partners, irrespective of whether or not the, uh, the birthing parent has experienced mental health issues. So the training that I'm going to be delivering is Thursday the 6th of May in a morning slot of 9.30 to 12.30 and Thursday the 20th of May an afternoon slot of 1.30 to 4.30. So we talk a lot more about kind of the, the context of looking at um, legislative backgrounds relating to LGBTQ parent families, discrimination and mental health, um, and also what good practice would look like in supporting LGBTQ parent families. There's a number of case studies. It's very interactive. So it's me talking, actually I'll talk through my story again, so you might hear a bit of that again. Um, and, and then there's opportunities to work in breakout rooms because it, it's done over Zoom. Um, and, and then we'll look at some case studies as well. So you can really kind of think about all the different issues that, that it's bringing up. So I look forward to seeing you, some, of, some of you there if you decide to come along. What I've also included um, are some links and these links are, are good for kind of signposting people as well for support. So the first one says the LGBT Mummies Tribe 
And this is an organization that has been set up and they do quite a lot of lobbying really for, um, and working alongside um, as a spokespeople for LGBTQ people, um, the NHS to start looking at um, um, parity of or an equity of um, services delivered as well, particularly thinking about the offer for lesbian mums to be um, in having to pay for their own treatment um, and whether or not that should be a means tested service. So the LGBT Mummies Tribe, but it's also a, a great resource for letting people know how they can start a family as well and all the different options. Um, and it's also a support network so people can join groups and find other parents within their area as well. Um, and then the, the third thing there, the, so looking at trans parents as well. Um, the fourth thing there, it says Seahorse film. So Seahorse, a dad who gave birth, is a documentary um, about a trans man called Freddie McConnell. Freddie McConnell also has a podcast. He has a website um, and he talks a lot about being a, um, a trans dad and being a, a trans parent. Then there's guidance from La Leche, um, support for transgender and non-binary parents various stonewall links there as well and the NCT and then I noticed at the beginning talked about kind of one of the slides the last bullet point talked about the increase of domestic abuse um, during this pandemic as well and Gallup the last bullet point here the last link here Gallup is uh, an LGBTQ organization that's um, uh, that supports and and kind of advises and educates around domestic abuse amongst other violence uh, within the LGBT community so that's a good link there uh, and also their, their most recent report looking at the experiences of LGBTQ people and domestic abuse. Um, so yeah, feel free to contact me as well. Um, I'm on Twitter occasionally, mainly posting or tweeting um, about when I'm doing some training. That's my email. So do feel free to contact me if you have any questions or any examples of excellent good practice that you want me to share around the country when I'm delivering training. Um, so that's the, the end of my presentation now, and I'm going to see if I can remove it so I can now see people. So I'm going to just press escape to see if that'll work. Right, how do I actually, there we go. Brilliant, oh no, sorry, I'm not that familiar with Teams. There we go, I'm back in the room. <laughs> oh, well done. Hi, Jenny. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, I've got the funky new um, symbols at the top of my um, screen so that I can give you some virtual applause, I think. Right. <laughs> so if anyone else has got that, just do join in. Right. Okay, there's a few of us having a go. Um, Thank you. Gosh, that was so thought provoking. And um, yeah, I'm really thinking about how even though you've shown us the timeline in in many respects it feels like we're right at the beginning of this and getting it right so um i think it, it's really really great that that we can you know hear this presentation and start to think about what changes we need to make because we have a, a massive ask and quite rightly now that everything that we do every new um development within perinatal services make sure that services are inclusive and it's so important that we get this work right so thank you for that that was really really thought provoking for me and I'm sure looking in the chat that um, other people feel the same as well thank you you're welcome thank you for asking me thank you OK, so now people that are used to um, our webinars know that our um, the thing that makes us all really nervous in the regional team is when we have a film <laughs> and we have a film today because I know we've had shockers in the past with films. So um, Mark Williams, who is a, as it says, a campaigner, author and speaker um, on the importance of of new fathers mental health. He has done this short film, which is available for everybody to use. So I just thought it would be a nice opportunity for everyone to watch it. It's about 10 minutes, I think, but also to see if it's something that, again, you can use with your new starters, 
for induction, whether it's something that'd be useful for your students, your current teams, um, because it's at 10 minutes, it's quite accessible to people um, just to start those conversations going and um, to, to, to start putting all of our partners on the agenda. So um, I'm not sure who was taking responsibility for this, what poor soul had to fall on that spike from our team, but oh, looks like we're there. So I shall hand over now then and um, enjoy, enjoy the film. So as we know, a lot of parents, they've got a past histories of anxiety, some with depression, and even some with severe traumas before they become parents. I've never dealt with those traumas. So I want to take you back to my own personal experience. I'm from up the valleys, not in oil here. My father was a gra um, and grandfather was a miner the other in the West Western. Very much a man up, you know, come on, let's get on with it. If we had a problem, we'd go down the pub. I never talked about mental health to my parents. We never talked about anything like that. Unfortunately for me in school, I couldn't keep still. I was very agitated in school. I, I, I find it hard to keep on a spot now. And what I didn't know at the time, I was diagnosed at 40 years of age with ADHD and dyslexia. So like I said, I had a lot of low self-esteem, unfortunately, before I became a parent. But luckily for me, I entered the youth club in the valleys and it was a gentleman who said, you can do anything with your life. Don't let anyone tell you you can't do anything with your life. And I went on to be a British champion. I was a national champion in three different sports. But unfortunately, I left school at 15 and the rave scene started kicking in in the 90s. You probably see me on Uncovered, Grease Uncovered somewhere with my glow stick. And, and I'm not proud to say, but unfortunately, I got into a lot of drugs, alcohol. That was my coping skill at the time. But luckily for me, I met my wife, Michelle. And we've been together 23 years now, and we've never had an argument ever <laughs> that I've won. <laughs> but luckily for me, she put me on a straight and narrow, and I went to sales and communication skills, and I was doing good money, very good money. Company car, all the material stuff that I'm not interested in now. And I was very fit. I always kept my feds fit. I was into kickboxing, all football, all sorts of things. But this is probably the hardest talk side of my talk. It was after 22 hours labor. I remember the doctors come rushing in and they said, Mr. Williams, your wife needs emergency C-section. We need to get down to the theater quick. The words emergency, I honestly thought my wife and baby was gonna die. And when I see Michelle in the theater, I honestly thought, oh my gosh, I've never been in a situation before. I felt helplessness. And what I know now is PTSD. So what is PTSD, guys? PTSD is an anxiety disorder, either witnessing or experiencing a life-threatening event. And that's a mild, moderate to severe end. Nothing worse than thinking your wife and baby's gonna die in that situation, yeah? And I worked in security nets, I worked in horrific things in my life. Nothing worse for me personally thinking they were both gonna die. Michelle went on to have severe post depression. We believe it was a lot of birth trauma, PTSD. And I was expecting to be back in work in two weeks. All of a sudden, I was home with my wife. I was, um, I was actually uh, in, a, in a place where I couldn't tell my friends, couldn't tell my family. It was crisis team. My wife was, didn't want to be here anymore. My personality was starting to change. It got to the point where my mother-in-law came to live with, live with us, and I'm still getting counselling for that now. <laughs> for what but on a serious note, I had a lot of family support. A lot of families, as you know, haven't got the support. During that postnatal period, like I said, my personality changed. I remember punching a sofa, I bust my hand. I was avoiding situations. I was using alcohol. I didn't initially get a bond attachment with my son, but I think that grew because I was skin to skin. That oxytocin, I think, helped me with that bond and attachment. I remember starting fights with bouncers, not because I had a chance of beating them. It was a, when somebody's hit the new, it's never form of self-harm. I couldn't tell my wife how I was feeling because I didn't want to impact on her mental health. And I was actually having suicidal thoughts in the postnatal period as well. But as a man, I was told just to man up and get on with it. What have you got to be depressed about? You didn't give birth to the baby. This didn't. I didn't. I was more concerned about my wife I was. So 
basically after five years I had a breakdown. I was in community mental health services diagnosed with um, ADHD. But what happened was when I set up a group with far, far fathers only supporting my partners with post depression, this is what I found. I found they were suffering from PTSD themselves, antenatal anxiety and depression. So if you've got a dad who witnessed trauma the first time round, the next baby comes along, obviously the anxiety is be higher now because now he's got to go into a labour ward where he witnessed that trauma the first time. And a smell can trigger off PTSD, as we know, yeah? Fathers with post depression. Gosh, no way, that's got to be hormonal. But there is a shift in fathers where testosterone levels goes less as well. And one in 10, as I'll explain, suffer from post depression, one in 10. And the importance of this talk today is, what's the biggest killer men under 15 UK guys? Suicide. And we're not screening fathers for their mental health at the moment. So this is why it's important. Paternal OCD, dads get the intrusive thoughts they could do something to the baby. Dads get these thoughts that social services are going to take the babies off them. Dads worry about some thoughts that mums get as well. So many fathers like myself are undiagnosed with bipolar, schizophrenia, clinical depression, ADHD, ASD, before they become dads. And they self-manage that. And then the baby comes along, the lack of sleep, wife or partner with post depression. There's loads of reasons why fathers suffer in the postnatal period, the first 12 months. And like mums, they struggle to bond with their children too. It does look different with fathers. So many fathers saying they're not good enough as well. They have low self-esteem. And as we know, fatherhood has totally changed from when my father was a minor. The pressures are different today. There's more single fathers. There's more stay-at-home dads. Dads feeling totally isolated. And sometimes it's only the dad who is suffering. And that impacts on mum's mental health as well. And of course, that has an impact on our development of the child. And we talk about vision today. My vision has always been if we support all parents in the antenatal period, as well as the postnatal period and beyond, it just has far better outcomes of the whole family and that development of that child. And this is what I use and some fathers use. Alcohol, drugs, you know, they feel anger, angry, suppressing their feelings. Never, only now we start in year more about mental health. And like me, I was never diagnosed. I went to other services years later. And a lot of fathers are just getting diagnosed with depression or anxiety. But when you look at the root of the cause, it could possibly be PTSD or post depression or anxiety during that time. And that's what perinatal mental health is. It's a big umbrella. It's the antenatal period as well as the first year in after the baby's born. So these are some of the studies. Now we've known this since 91, guys. But one in 10 fathers suffer from post depression, and it was one in 10 for years for mums. But once we started getting the education out there and the screening, we know now it's far more. So one in 10 fathers, that's 75,000 fathers in the UK every year suffering with some sort of depression during this time. Looking after your partner with post depression, up to 50% of dads get depressed during this. My argument is, okay, sometimes it's only dad who's struggling, but it's gotta be up to 50% for mums as well, aren't they? So up to 50%. There's so many reports out there now. The NCT did a report that 38% of dads struggle with their mental health in the first year. 73% were concerned about their partner's mental health. 73%. Young fathers, 39% of young fathers wanted support for their mental health and there was nothing there for them. And November have just done a report as well. They said that 33% of dads were stressed during this time, usually were stressed. And also the first year of fatherhood, one in five fathers felt totally isolated. We know it has far better outcomes when you support all parents, same gender parents, everyone during this time. We talk about early prevention. Or we need to start looking at pregnancy when we talk about mental health. Let's start from pregnancy and move on. 
Because it does have far better outcomes, guys. I want to take you to think away. There's 600,000 male suicides every year. 600,000 male suicides. And we know it's far higher because of the stigma around suicide as well, unfortunately. 40 cent times more likely to be rated a suicide risk during the perinatal period than at any other time in a man's life. So that's why it's so important, so important about looking at the new father's mental health. I wanted my journey to be something good, to come out of something bad. I've been lucky to set up International Father's Mental Health Day, which is actually registered now on the World Health Organization, uh, sorry, the uh, World Calendar for Mental Health. And also, how are you, Dad, the hashtag, I want the conversations when health visitors ask, how are you doing? We all have a mental health, aren't we? It's either good or bad. We want health visitors, parents to educate themselves that this can happen to dads as well. The amount of relationships that end in is absolutely horrendous. Sometimes their behaviours do look different than mums when posting pressure, especially. So I want to end on what the work I've done, I want to inspire you. I'm just a guy from the valleys, and I've been fortunate to be on TV and radio stations, not just in the UK, but around the world. After leaving school at 15 no qualifications, I've actually met Dr. Jane Hanley, and we've spoken in universities around the UK. I've been lucky enough to meet the Royal Family, where, as we know, they are really big advocates for mental health. And I won't tell you the conversation I had with, with William, I can call him William now, but, um, <laughs> But he told, he said about his own struggles with fatherhood, yeah? So I want to leave you on this, guys. When you think the biggest killer of men and the 50 is suicide, just ask the simple question. And we need to think of this really quickly. If you know anyone who has become a dad, just ask him four simple words. How are you, dad? Thank you. Okay, so there's Mark um, summing up really nicely for us the needs for of our um, dads. Um, so we're just switching back to presentation mode now. Um, and as Liz said earlier, in line with our hashtag hello my name is theme, looking at some of the slightly more unusual roles across the perinatal pathway. Um, we're going to hand over to Ali and Chris, who are carers, peer support workers, and they're going to share with us some of the work that they've been doing since they've been in post. So um, Ali and Chris, are you are you ready to go with the? Yeah, we're ready to go. Brilliant. OK, well, I'll disappear then and I'll hand over to you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, just can everyone see the screen? Looking good to me, Ali. Yeah, Lovely. yeah. OK, fantastic. Let's you might want to go into the big yeah slideshow. Brilliant. OK, Thanks. lovely. First of all, thank you very much for this opportunity um, and inviting us to this event. So hello, our names are Chris and Ali, and we are carer peer support workers for the perinatal community team. Quite a mouthful there. So the reason we're in role and we've been in role nearly a year is because we have lived experience of caring for a loved one who has had or has a mental health difficulty. So over to you, Chris. Yeah, hi there, everyone. Um, you know, I've got a little blurb there. Um, my partner was diagnosed with bipolar when, uh, when she was pregnant with our, our first child, my son, seven years ago, uh, and then uh, had a, an episode of postpartum psychosis when uh, when he was born. So we had a, a very long stay in, in MBU and, and several other services involved as well, uh, which led me on to my own history of depression. Um, so I, I got into this role because I've been in all of mental health services ever since uh, that pregnancy. 
um, and I've wanted to contribute in some way ever since. Um, so I'm here now doing the role that wasn't there when I really, really needed it. Thanks, Chris. So my name is Ali and I guess I continue to be a carer for my daughter, sort of it goes in phases. Um, but she was diagnosed with bipolar after two really serious bouts of psychosis, which seemed to go on for a long time. Um, so the first episode, it was my first experience of serious mental health um, and it was a mighty shock. And I, I, you know, I didn't know what to do, how to help her, where to turn. Um, so she was involved with the IP for three years. Um, and during that time, I really grew to value the support um, that we were given. So even though there was no dedicated care or peer support, everybody was also supportive and kind to me and it made a big difference. So our simple task was to support the partners and family members of patients who are under the community perinatal mental health team. So for us, it's been a very exciting and rewarding challenge. And our, uh, initially our post was, was only for a year. And after that, we didn't know what would happen. But we since are now employed full time, which we're very grateful for. So we started a real blank slate. First of all, we were a blank slate. Our only experience was with our own personal experiences as carers. The job was totally new um, and there were only three carer peer sport workers in the whole of Southern Health. So we couldn't have done it with all the support that we've had. We're very lucky with our manager um, and one of our team leaders, Emily Kite, who was a real champion of carers. Um, and she, you know, she supported all our crazy ideas. Um, and that was amazing. And obviously our team and our carers um, leads as well, Neve initially, and then Amelia in the trust, they've been amazing. So as I said, blank slate. So we've done a lot of training and learning um, as much as we can. Again, we were given that support in to enable us to do as much training as we needed. And it's that's ongoing. So our first, the first thing we did was a referral form and we were so proud um, and that really launched us. So, so far we've um, looked after over 120 carers. So who are our carers? Our carers are mainly partners. So that makes up about 85% of the people that we look after. And then 15% um, are maternal grandmothers. So mums of mums normally. Um, often women are single parents and, and their mum is um, their main supporter. But I've also had one young carer and also offered signposting for children within the families. But we're obviously open going forward to friends and family and other family members as well. So we started with, with, with our own experience. That's what we had. And from then on, we became carer led. So we're always listening. First of all, we started to sort of looking at the themes of what what were people talking about you know what were they saying and taking things from there and then later on asking you know what would you like to see us do so it's just trial and error see what carers want see what works rinse and repeat and always trying to improve so what have we done so far so the basis of our work is one to one support that's mainly what what we do so obviously it's been covid dependent um, so depending on what the rules have been at the time is what we've been able to do. So obviously telephone calls, video calls. Um, Chris has done lots of walks in the park, but we're looking forward to coffee shops and being able to visit people in their own homes. We've um, got Zoom groups going. So this is one of those things where it's been trial and error. We started during the day and we didn't have any themes for our meetings and hardly anybody came and we were quite despondent. Um, sometimes we'd have one, usually no one came. So we changed that in January. Um, so now we do them in the evenings, twice a month, and they're themed. And we've also started to invite professionals. So the themes we've had, we've had focus group, again, always asking, what would you like to see? What are you interested in? Um, we Other themes have been stress how to support your partner, 
bonding with baby, which we had our nursery nurse come along and that was really successful. We've had a quiz night and a hobbies night. We still haven't got massive numbers, but we do have four plus every time, which for us, that's like amazing success. And we hope to build on that. So another big thing that we do is we help with communication between between professionals and carers. Carers often have questions and we can liaise and be that bridge. Another enormous part of what we do is signposting and referrals. So um, to this effect, Chris, I'll hand this one over to you. Uh, yeah, we one of our challenges when we uh, first started was to start collating um, a good good uh, sort of selection of signposting and resources that we can we can pass on to all the partners and the other family members. Um, and actually, it's all turned out to be a bit of a challenge getting that together. So um, I've, I've built a, a directory um, that works a bit like an app for the computer that um, yeah, you, can, you can click between like, what the screenshot says there, uh, various different subjects and, and anything we come across uh, that we think is a useful signposting resource goes in there and we can we can pass it on quickly and easily to people. Lovely. And we've also rolled that out to the rest of the team. So it's something that we can all use. And hopefully, I'm not sure if they're using it, but hopefully they are. We'll find out. So another thing we've been doing is developing professional relationships and having regular network. Um, again, that's something we were completely new to. First of all, we started working as individuals and then we realised it was really important to sort of reach out and talk to others. So, for example, IAP services. We're trying to get around all the services and develop relationships, learn what they do in order that we can sign posts properly and with confidence um, and that that's going really well um, also we've had meetings are going to continue to have regular meetings oh sorry with Dawn Brenchley the special health visitor again to learn about what health visitors do in order to signpost our carers there um, also research Andy Mayers he's been helping and advising us we're attending carer peer support groups with which we've initiated and perinatal um, peer reviews we've been attending as well so that we're kind of learning um, what others are doing and also sharing what we're doing um, yeah and also yes we've been supporting others a lot because I guess there are there haven't been many of us so far people are coming saying, well, what are you doing you know and, and we're sharing what we're doing and also learning about what other people are doing and planning to do so Chris I'll hand over to you for this one yeah, this this idea, I don't really know where it came from, actually, to be honest, do I? Um, but we decided to start a newsletter to, for our carers to keep them informed about sort of changes in our service, um, you know, what's new. Um, and, and also it was a great way to get sort of self-care tips and um, and the information on our Zoom groups out there. Uh, and this has been by far our, our greatest uptake. Nearly every carer signs up to it and over half of them read it every month. Um, and, and as it says on the list there, we do do lots of information, self-care tips. Um, I, I put recipes in there, uh, which has got a bit of a personal story to it, because uh, when my partner went to the NBU, I couldn't cook for toffee and uh, and had to learn very, very quickly how to cook a reasonable meal rather than something from the freezer. Um, and then, yeah, we do um, sort of a jargon buster and we also do a, a spotlight that um, sort of just highlights a, a member of our team each month. Uh, with a little bit of a backstory about them just to make them you know far more human and more approachable like we all really are and also chris about the quest we've started asking questions haven't we again oh, yeah, yeah we do more questions in there for the carers as well yeah there's a mini survey each month as well that's a new one sorry i forgot about it <laughs> thank you so we've got a Facebook page as well, which is for signposting education and general promotion of what we're doing. And it's also a kind of a opportunity to have a wider perinatal mental health exposure. So we, again, like I said, always asking what people want. We have surveys to an interim survey, which we do two or three calls in and then a discharge survey um, just to make sure people are happy with what they're doing. And if they're not, any feedback and what we can learn and also what they'd like to see next. So what have we learned <laughs> so far from our carers? First of all, 
I mean, I guess these things are obvious, but I, I don't think we were expecting them necessarily. So carers share very difficult and complicated emotions with us on a very wide range of top topics, and they're not always about the caring role. Um, we've learned that probably about one in 10 partners have either a pre-existing mental health condition or a condition that's developed during the perinatal period. So we encourage them to go to the GP and we refer them to IAPT as well. Um, and as part of this, we are involved with a long term plan planning within our team. So a big part of what we do is carers talk a lot about their relationships. Um, this is huge, isn't it, Chris? Yeah, it is. Absolutely. The vast majority of my conversations are relationship based rather than caring role based. Yeah. Um, also, we talk a lot. Well, carers talk a lot about baby bonding and the difficulty they may have bonding with their babies. And also um, something I wasn't necessarily expecting for myself, one in 10 carers report that what the patients are saying to their professionals is not what's really happening at home. Um, and obviously this has opened up conversations within the team. Um, and I think it's a, probably an interesting dimension that's that's different to what, what was being experienced before. Also, Chris and I, we've had an amazing amount of personal growth ourselves um during this process so what are our future plans so chris do you want to talk about this yeah yeah one of our original ideas when we came in to the post was to have a a drop-in clinic um with rabbit is um drop-in clinic on the mother and baby unit in winchester uh where sort of one one evening a week or something like that uh, we could be there on on the unit um, for for any of the partners and family that come along to to visit their loved ones. They could come in and see us for a chat face to face, just drop in and see us. Um, it's something that I know when my partner was in the unit, I could really have done with um, because there is a lot of complicated and difficult emotions, especially in those first few weeks. Um, and yeah, it would have been really helpful for me. Unfortunately, COVID has stomped all over that so far so uh, but fingers crossed for the future we'll be able to do it yeah and i agree with chris that that real initial crisis moment when you're just totally stumped and you you don't know where your head is um i think that would be really valuable for us to be able to do that um obviously face-to-face -face groups um, once COVID restri restrictions are lifted. I think we'll keep our Zoom groups um, because we've got a quite a, a wide geographical location. Um, you know, people don't necessarily want to be traveling, um, you know, a long Very distance. Accessible. Yes. Sorry, Chris, go on. Very accessible, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. But obviously, you know, we would like to do face to face groups. So, um, a big plan really going forward is trying to link carers together. So obviously we're doing that now in our within our groups, but to do that more and to link carers in with the wider community. So <laughs> putting carers to work. So, for example, we've had a um, one partner, a dad involved in the long term meeting um, plan. He came to the last meeting. We've linked up um, dads of twins together. Um, we've had a carer giving a talk about what it's like to be a carer during the pandemic. Um, and we're looking forward, really, this is long term, to our carers becoming leaders and supporters in their own right. Um, we started, oh yeah, we'd like to do a Facebook group, private, where carers can get together and talk to each other. Um, yeah, that's something we're looking to do. And there's a lot, lot more. How am I for time? Okay. Um, so Chris and I, are going to um, be trainers um, in family connections. Um, we're going to have another questionnaire. So we're tracking people's progress along our service. So an initial one, an interim and a, a discharge. And we're going to develop that. We'd like to do a staff questionnaire to sort of get a real feel of how the service feels about the service we offer and where they, they see us going next. Um, also, family work is going to be um taken up within the team um we're going to be doing vig hopefully and we're also about to train with the hampton trust um to 
support domestic abuse perpetrators in the sense of catching it early and being able to signpost people so that, again, so that relationships can improve for women who want to stay. I know this is very controversial. Um, so, <laughs> OK, on that note, strange note to end on. Um, thank you very much for having us. Thank you so much, you guys. You've achieved so much in, in a relatively short space of time. Um, does anybody have any questions? Anybody want to pop up and ask a question? We've actually got a few minutes um, for questions um, to Chris and Ali. And also, I'm not sure if Lucy, are you still on the call to take any questions at the moment? Uh, yes, happy to take questions. OK, so we've got Lucy, um, Ali and Chris, if anybody wants to pop up and ask any questions of them in the last few minutes. I guess if, if people have gone a bit shy, um, I've got one probably for you, Lucy. It's it's about language and what term or terms should we be thinking about to to get that sort of inclusivity, but also not have a title that goes on with loads of words in it? Do you know what I mean? Sometimes mm -hmm. when you're trying to be inclusive, these things become a bit clunky and unusable. And I just wondered if there was um, one or two acceptable terms that encompassed quite a few different things yeah um i mean you could i i mean i this is a question i get asked quite a lot actually thinking that it's kind of go you know the list will go on forever um so it kind of just depends what you're trying to say but you could use things like i don't know co-parent or um so it kind of depends what yeah what mm. you what you're trying to say um to because partners is obviously really good, but then I, I think, like I said, that you know, my wife is not my daughter's part, our daughter's partner. So it's kind of like who, who are we? Because uh, obviously a dad is the dad of the child. Um, so it could, yeah, it could be use of co-parent, um, co-mother, because it's predominantly. It, it depends if you're predominantly then having just a, you know, a, a, a female birthing person. Um, so I think probably co-parents, and but we also have to think about that um, trans men are birthing people too, and will be, you know, maybe accessing support as well. We can, yeah, I need to have a more kind of definitive answer for this question actually, <laughs> but it's something that we can discuss more in the training, and I'll because um, it, it kind of depends what you're trying to do if it's to advertise a group or if it's to yeah. To I, I me. Think so. In yeah. my head, I was thinking yeah. about groups and also thinking about Chris and Ali's work and thinking for those carers supporters what would if you're saying run so carers works I suppose yeah um definitely carers works I suppose the the main thing would be to have um if, if it is for all carers to have images that reflect that some might be women some might be grandparents or you know whatever those carers are yeah um, to have it more visual because I remember a friend of mine she's, she's one of the case studies her partner had her wife had postpartum psychosis and she was given the leaflet this was six years ago and the leaflet was a picture of a man with his head in his hands and she, at that point she thought a I'm not a man and b he's got his head in his hands this isn't going to go well so it was that kind of like but she immediately she was like is am I going to get help here or am I just going to be dismissed as not even being the other parents you know you, yeah so yeah so I suppose a lot of it is so carers is great it's then okay or co-parents brilliant yeah well we don't need to over complicate it Sorry. then that's yeah. that, that's really good <laughs> really mm. good so um unless there's any other um questions I think I'm going to hand back to Liz just to um, Alison going to say something close, Did you? close for us Jenny can I just quickly interject mm. We have quite a lot of people objecting to the word carer, mm. especially uh, partners. They, they, and and the women often say, "Well, he's not my carer; he's my partner." 
you know so that's an, another dynamic yeah so definitely one that we're not quite there with but actually we know that we are looking at it so I think that's it's like that start of 10 isn't it we're, yeah. we're on, on the way I think we a know. few thumbs up with a co-parent so in terms of maybe father's co-parent the thing is you don't then want to group necessarily everyone together on, on what the offer is but this can be you know discuss further in the, the training yeah. as well yeah uh, okay well thank you so much to to you guys for for talking today it's been another really um thought-provoking um webinar and uh it's it's really going to help inform our work going forwards both with the i was going to say dads and partners dads and co-parents work and um also with inclusivity as well so thank you very much indeed and i'll, I'll hand back to liz now Thank you, Jenny. And yes, we'd just like to reiterate my thanks to all the speakers today for fantastic presentations and also to Mark for letting us share his video. Um, so just a reminder that our next webinar is on the 21st of April, so um, only a couple of weeks away, um, and that will be focusing on care leavers. Um, so we hope that you can join us for that and just a reminder so um going back to the national workshops that are taking place the next workshop for them is the partners assessment which is on thursday the 15th of april so if you want to attend and you haven't signed up to it yet then please get in touch with the national team so without further ado i'd like to thank everybody for joining us today um have a good rest of week hopefully um people will be able to have some rest over the extended bank holiday weekend and we look forward to seeing you in April. Take care.